Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we saw the Popham colony quickly rise and fall. Just to review, the short-lived colony in modern-day Maine was set up by the Plymouth Company, or the Virginia Company of Plymouth, which was the sister company of the Virginia Company of London. In 1603, Sir Walter Riley, who held vast rights, uh, at least in the English imagination, to the lands in North America, had them taken away from him as he was implicated in a plot against King James. By 1606, those rights had been redefined and redistributed between these two aforementioned companies. But by the end of 1608, the Popham colony had packed up and gone back home to merry old England for better prospects. However, what is referred to in the 1606 charter as the first company, or the Virginia Company of London, they had the colony of Jamestown. They had boots on the ground, fledgling as it was. The company out of London had its territory outlined in the 1606 charter and had a colony already there. The Northern Company, however, had nothing. And because of the loss of the Popham colony, a lot of the investors who were in the Plymouth Company moved to the Southern Company, the London Company, the First Company, however you want to say it as did the service of the boat, the Virginia, that was built at Popham Colony, and several of the settlers moved themselves down to Jamestown eventually. And so the southernmost sister company cannibalized her northern kin to make herself stronger. Now, at this point in the textbooks, most, a lot of them don't even mention Popham Colony. We would focus on Jamestown, and we would focus on the Virginia Company of London, and we would be talking about the activities of John Smith down there and Pocahontas and so on. But of course, you know we're not going to do that. This is the Other States of America History podcast. We're going to look at what happened to the Northern Company. And things sound bleak already. But just a little bit of more review from the Popham Colony, just to remind you. Sir John Popham, Chief Lord High Justice of England and main financer of the colony specifically that was on the Sagadahawk that we call the Popham Colony, he died. He died before the settlers ever even made it to Maine. And then the on-the-ground president of the colony was his own nephew, George Popham. Well, over the winter at the Popham colony, George Popham dies. Back in England, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, who we met in the last episode, steps into the role as the principal leader and organizer. And then, at Popham colony proper, Riley Gilbert takes over, one of the assistant presidents. Gilbert is the half-nephew of Sir Walter Riley, whose rights used to encompass this area more or less, and the son of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who many decades before this had claimed uh, Newfoundland for the English. At this time, pedigree meant something, and he was an able man. Uh, the colony might have turned into something quite significant, except for the fact that Sir Riley Gilbert's brother, John Gilbert, Sir John Gilbert, dies, and his inheritor is Riley Gilbert. And now Riley Gilbert is looking at a, an inheritance of a large chunk of land, castle, I believe, and a proper English title. And so the decision was made to pack up the colony and go home. And so now with several minutes into this episode, let's push ahead after Popham. What's going to happen after Riley Gilbert packs everything up? After that initial settlement is gone? What happens the very next year? What happens the very next season? Because the Virginia Company has this huge claim and has all the English rights to settle this huge swath of land that middle school social studies teachers would call a good chunk of the middle colonies, which shared the rights with the uh, southernmost London company, but also all of what today we would call New England. And after Popham falls apart, we have a colonization company without a colony. So what's going on? Your high school textbook would just jump right ahead to Plymouth, of course. The Pilgrims, the Separatists, 1620, Squanto and all that. But now I'm done with the preamble, let's dig a little deeper. First of all, before the Popham colony, there were already English people in what is now modern-day Maine and other parts of New England. We know this because there were a few Abenaki natives who knew how to speak English, or at least a rudimentary understanding of the language. This came from the English taking captives, which we have learned about in our last episode, and those captives are documented. But there were other individuals who learned English from English people showing up. These are mostly going to be male traders looking to trade for fur pelts. But more plentiful than the fur traders were the fishermen, and many of the fur traders were fishermen. The fishing operations out of Bristol go back to the time of Giovanni Caboto. John Cabot 
over 100 years before our point in time. And they had been expanding operations straight across the Atlantic for a long time. And so in 1608, with the Popham Colony no more, there were colonists there who had pretty significant knowledge of the different ways that you could make money there. And perhaps some of these colonists had been in the area before Popham Colony ever existed as part of one of these operations. One of these persons was the Popham colonist Humphrey Damarill. This man, between our date 1608 and 1614, and I'll get to my source on this in a minute, had constructed a store to help supply fishing operations in the area at a location that is now probably derived from his name, Damaris Cove. By all description, this was not a sanctioned settlement or store or trading post or summer colony of the Plymouth Company and would cater to customers from all nations. So you'll see other fishing operations, uh, particularly among the Basque people. They did a lot of fishing uh, from this area all the way back to jolly old Europe, but also the Dutch and the French and the Portuguese. Damarill would supply whoever was willing to pay. And the Plymouth Company, not having the resources to sell licenses and then enforce those licenses and patrol the coast, at least from 1608 on for a long while, really couldn't do anything about this. But now here's the real question, right? Plymouth prides itself in 1620 as being the first permanent English settlement in that portion of the continent. But the Maris Cove and some other examples we're going to look at might be contenders. I don't know. We know that in the far future of 1622, the Maris Cove had employees who were permanently living there all four seasons. Was it that case in 1608? Who knows? Perhaps by 1614, when there were a lot of structures present, the timeline is fuzzy. Just our first example of the mysterious settlements that were pre-Plymouth post Popham. This is not insignificant, but we're going to move ahead out of the year 1608, and I'm going to leave it with a quote from the historian Charles Knowles Bolton. It is not too much to affirm that Damaris Cove was from 1608, let us say, to about 1625, the chief maritime port of New England. Now let us turn to right about the year 1610, Monhegan Island. There are sources that say from about that year on, there was a trading post there. Now Monhegan Island is right off the coast of Maine. A lot of these early European settlements, they loved being on islands, little island in a river, little island off the coast, or they like being on a little peninsula because it's very well defended. You can have the space you want from the native population that you know very little about. Now, there are some reports that not only was there a trading post there from about 1610 on, but there were crews that overwintered there. Now we're getting into, again, this debate about what does it mean to colonize? If you have a an area, I'm not even gonna call it a settlement. You, you got an area full of buildings and you have people there year round. Is that not a colony? It's not a community in the family sense, but is it a colony? I'll get right back to that. But first, why would you, why would you be a fishing operation? Why would you need to overwinter somewhere? Well, for one reason, there's lots of reasons, but for one reason is that this is kind of a lawless area. Again, the Plymouth company cannot really enforce anything at this time. And so let's say you find a great fishing spot. You've done your fishing out at sea. You found a great spot to dry the fish on flakes, these, these wooden racks where you could salt and dry your fish, pre preferably cod, to bring back to Europe. Well, with these seasonal operations, the principle of move your feet, lose your seat comes into play. I don't know if that's the legal term. I doubt it. But basically, you return in the spring and somebody's beaten you to your spot. Somebody has taken over your racks. Any structures you might have made there, they just assume it. They occupy your space. And then you have to start all over again. Build new structures, make new racks, and perhaps do it in a less desirable or less useful area. And this is why we see summer colonies. That would be, like we said, a seasonal operation with a not-so-settled settlement that would be unoccupied for a large portion of the year. Turn slowly into a year-round operation where there'd be an overwinter staff just to hold the claim in lieu of any legal deed or law enforcement. So bringing it back to Monhegan Island, after the year 1610, this might have become necessary, in which case we would have some level of permanent occupation on that island a decade before Plymouth is settled. To quote the historian James Finney Baxter, dim and uncertain 
are the glimpses we get of this period. In this very same narrow band of time, let's just go 1608 to 1612 or so, it seems the English themselves, against the claims and rights and privileges of the Plymouth Company, are treating the New England coast like the Wild West and making a law all their own. We're not even talking about what other nations are doing right now in the area. Now, let's remember the very bottom of the Plymouth Company's claim overlaps with the London Company and would include what is today New York City, the Hudson River. If you listen to the first season of this podcast, you'll know by this time the Dutch have an interest in that area. And after the voyages of Henry Hudson, maybe a little before, it's debatable, fur trading operations are penetrating far up the Hudson River to modern-day Albany County, at least. They are now calling it New Netherland, which must have surprised some Englishmen because the old Netherlands wasn't even that old, having at least ended temporarily hostilities with Spain, which had formally claimed it. They were already branching off into colonies and industrious people. But now let's go to the top of the claim, to basically the area of Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. Before Popham Colony had ever existed, Champlain and his companions had attempted settlements, the first of which was St. Croix, which was right on the, pretty much right on the Canadian-American border, but it's actually on the American side. And then a year later, Port Royal, which is actually over the line and on the Canadian side. That's on today's maps, of course. They have some difficulties, but in this post-Popham period, they come back. So let's limit ourselves right to the slice of time that is 1612. You have the Dutch to the south. You got the French to the north. Not even that far north. Really, right on your back. Then you have every English sailor and his brother running amok all up and down the coast, uh, mostly with fisheries, but also trading fur when, they, where they, when and where they could. The Virginia Company of Plymouth essentially reigned on paper, but had no rule over this area. And you know what I forgot to mention? I forgot to mention the Native Americans, who had been there for a very long time and greatly outnumbered all of these different European ethnic groups added together. Of course, these Native Americans recognized no such suzerainty of these, this English company over them. All of this being true, the Plymouth Company still limped along. And it is believed that the Popham family, the inheritors of Sir John Popham, still maintained fishing and fur trading operations. There are a few scant references to a Popham's port. And in and around the area of what is now Bristol, Maine, it's known that the Popham family did continue to have operations move in and out of there. Nothing on the scale of the short-lived Popham colony. And it's unlikely at an early date that there was any sort of overwinter habitation. This is not a permanent settlement. And now I'm going to move from the Popham family back to this, this character I mentioned in the last episode, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, which if you didn't listen to the last episode, most of this episode is not going to make any sense, first of all, but Sir Ferdinando Gorgias was an English knight, and he was the commander of the fort found at the port of Plymouth, Plymouth, England, that is. And that's why it's called the Plymouth Company. Gorgias and the community around him, and the merchant adventurer community, and a good chunk of the West Country were the financial backers of this company. It is the Plymouth Company, and Sir Ferdinando Gorges is the epicenter of it for a large portion of its history. And again, I'm using that word Plymouth. Don't think pilgrims. Haven't even gotten there yet. Now, Gorges himself, we know that he's still sending ships to the coast of New England. Your main source of income right now is fish. But the fur trade is growing. The prices of pelts back in Europe is going up significantly because beavers don't procreate like other rodents. They're not like rabbits. And so they could be hunted clear out of an area quickly. On the continent of Europe, uh, the actual beaver populations are being pushed to the hinterlands of Russia. So it's actually becoming profitable to go get it now from North America because you're, you're still talking about a huge distance to go. One thing Gorgias did in the 16 aughts that he's now going to do in the 1610s is he has ship captains kidnap natives off the coast. We learned about five of these that ended up becoming part of the Popham story. Three of them lived with Gorgias and two lived with Popham. He lived with them, like in, in his house. They were guests. He taught them English. He treated them very well. He listened to their stories, found out about this magical area that was called Northern Virginia, 
or more specifically around the main area, Norumbega. And the natives typically told him everything he wanted to know, whatever he wanted to know, in order to get themselves back to New England. Usually, uh, they convinced him there were gold mines or a way to China. In 1611, the story would be no different. Gorgeous receives five natives captured by a captain by the name of Edward Harlow. Now, to Gorgeous's credit, in this case, and I don't know if I believe him, he claims that Edward Harlow didn't work for him, but that he kidnapped these people, who were probably Wampanoag, at least a few of them, and somehow knew Gorgeous wanted them. So you put the pieces together. I don't know. The most important of these captives was a man by the name of Epinal. We know his history fairly well, considering he was a Native American in a time and place where the only writers were English, and they barely had any idea what was going on in the Native American world. Epinal lived with Gorgeous along with another native by the name of Sassacomit. Gorgeous learned a lot from these people. He learned, just by observing them, that Sassacomit and Epinal did not speak the same language, at least initially. But given a small amount of time, they were able to communicate with one another. Gorgeous deduced that they spoke related languages, but not the same language. He was 100% correct. Where Sassacomit probably spoke Abenaki, or one of the languages of northern New England, Epinal was Wampanoag, who could probably speak quite comfortably for any of the natives that would have occupied what is now Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. But it becomes a little harder to communicate once you get down to where the Lene Lenape lived, for instance, or again up where the Abenaki were, or cer certainly by the time you got to the Mi'kmaq. These were all Algonquian languages, but just like English is an Indo-European language, it doesn't mean you're going to understand Russian, which is also an Indo-European language. Related, but different enough that you couldn't understand it, at least right away. But once they had an understanding and a command of English, they filled Gorgeous's head with all sorts of tales. One example in Gorgeous's writings, he was convinced that this large North American animal that we would now call a moose could be domesticated and be a new form of cattle. The natives convincing him that they were somehow docile, trainable, which of course, aside from Bullwinkle, is not true. But what Epinal filled Gorgeous's mind with was gold. Gold. Once he realized that Gorgeous really valued this shiny yellow rock, Epinal laid it out. Oh yeah, I know where tons of this stuff is. We got caves full of this. Yeah, all you have to do is get me back to where I'm from. I'll show you where it all is. We don't even like this stuff. Now this is the umpteenth example of this happening to a European. Somehow capturing a native and that native talking their way very intelligently back to where they were from or back to their base of power so they could have the upper hand, usually by realizing these people really like gold. Well, let's put Epinal on the back burner for just a minute as we move into the year 1613. Baron Lord Delaware, who was the governor of Virginia at the time, among his other titles and responsibilities back in England, was one of the chief architects of the 1606 charter that created these two English colonization companies. Popham and Gorgeous, of course, headed the second company, the Northern Company. Lord Delaware threw down his money with the Southern Company, the first company, the company that founded Jamestown. Now, as governor of Virginia, he's going to order a very capable man named Captain Samuel Argyll, the man who successfully kidnapped Pocahontas, a move which eventually created a tenuous peace between the Powhatan and the people of Jamestown. Delaware is going to order him to get in his boats and travel north, control the coast, and remove any Europeans that might be there who are not of English origin. Now, at first, this would sound like a favor to the Plymouth Company. We're going to use our resources to clear out your competitors from the waters right outside of your domain, as you seem unwilling or unable to do so. But the caveat here is that the London Company, which is running Jamestown and the Virginia colony in general, is also using these waters to obtain fish to feed their now starting to grow southern colony. In what is a clear overreach or violation of the 1606 charter that Lord Delaware himself helped set up. And if you listen to the last season of this podcast when we covered New France, you'll know that Argyll, in a single swoop, took out the French colony on Mount Desert Island, 
And then he also took out Port Royal, which would now be abandoned for a second time. He was extremely effective against the French. Argyll also stopped on Manhattan Island, where there were Dutch traders. But at this early date of 1613, not much in the way of a colony or a settlement or too many structures. So he didn't really have anything to destroy. But he told the traders there who owned this land. And trust me, he didn't say the Native Americans. This overreaching action set off alarms in Gorgeous's head. Because instead of these little rinky-dink operations, taking fish inside a domain that's supposedly controlled and should be licensable through the Plymouth Company, this move was undertaken by its own sister company. This was more like a corporate takeover or an attempted um, merger of sorts. Now, I don't believe Gorgeous states anything here, but after the year 1613, there are now renewed attempts to take this moribund Plymouth Company and breathe some new life into it. Because in this time, when push comes to shove, and usually when there's a new king, charters like these get rescinded or they get reviewed. And if that moment were to come in 1613, a reasonable ruler might just swallow up the Plymouth Company and hand it all over to the Virginia Company of London. And so now let's keep that in our minds. The pressure is on for Gorgeous. But he has this guy. He has Epinal, the Wampanoag, who learned English, who became a bit of a celebrity because he had a mouth on him and he was a charmer. And he had a mastery of the language that most people didn't expect somebody so new to the country to have. After reading the descriptions of him, I picture... I picture Jordan Belfort. I picture the uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character from The Wolf of Wall Street. Will look you dead in the eye and tell you a really good lie that he knows you really want to be true. And when Epinal told Gorgeous that yes, the island that I am from, that you refer to as Martha's Vineyard, it's full of gold mines. We have this stuff all over the place. And you folks have treated me so gosh darn nice here. I would show you exactly wherever, where all that is. Just all you gotta do is take me home. That's all you gotta do. You're going to be made for life. Gorgeous couldn't help himself. He contracted a ship, told the captain the plan, and Epinal was headed home. The captain of this current expedition had been on the expedition where it, when Epinal was captured. So he knew generally where to go. And of course, Epinal, once uh, spotting Martha's Vineyard, would know where to find his settlement. And when the first canoes of his relatives came by, they were allowed on board. And right in front of the English, he was able to talk to them in Wampanoag. His gestures indicated that he wanted the other Wampanoag to know that the English were friendly. And that we should show them where something is. Everything was very happy and helpful and peaceful. And so the next day, when the men on the ship spotted the same canoes come by again, they thought, this is great. Maybe we can disembark soon and be knee-deep in gold. But as the canoes sidled right up to the big old ship. Epinel ran. He jumped and he got one foot up there on the ledge, and the English grabbed him. But from the canoes below, arrows began flying over Epinel's head. It provided a momentary distraction, and Epinel, being a big, strong man, striving for his freedom, broke free and leapt overboard. And the arrows didn't stop until the canoes were paddling away. This was the plan that Epinel had laid out to his relatives right in front of the English. A cunning man, we'll see him again in this episode and in our next episode. And so for Gorgeous and the Plymouth Company, 1614, so far turning out to be a huge failure. And yet in the same year, a very familiar character to you and I shows up a little further north than we would expect him to be. But John Smith himself, yes, John Smith of Jamestown and Pocahontas fame, is on his own sailing expedition. He has with him at least two boats. And he's looking for gold, a northwest passage, but he's also prepared along the way to make money with fishing, whaling, and perhaps fur trading. And he is one of our only primary eyewitness accounts of this area during this time. For instance, he goes through the modern day area of Maine and he sees Popham's operations, or the Popham family rather, Damaris Cove, and he also checks out Monhegan Island. Despite the Argyll raid, he runs into a couple French ships perhaps financed by the Poutrincourt family. He records the beauty of Martha's Vineyard, a place we just were, and how he would love to make a plantation there someday. In today's dollars, it'd be quite an expensive plantation. He was quite comfortable there, and he, and he described the area 
much as one would describe the southern regions of England itself or the north of France. He himself had learned about the area from Gosnold, Bartholomew Gosnold, who helped start Jamestown and who was the subject of our episode before Popham because he had a very short-lived colony that we just called Gosnold's Colony on Cuddyhunk Island. And as I said, he had at least two ships. And the captain of the other ship, subservient to John Smith, was a man by the name of Thomas Hunt, who was a real something that rhymes with Hunt, who before returning to Europe, when John Smith had taken his boat and gone his own separate way, he went to taking captives along the coast. His intention was to sell them into Iberian slavery at one of these ports in Spain. Most important to history, this episode and our next episode, maybe the episode after that, I don't know, is that one native he took was a Wampanoag from the village of Patuxet, whose name was Tisquantum. You might know him better from history as Squanto. At this time, the English had a very dim view of slavery. Of course, for a while, that changes. They view it as a necessary thing, then a necessary evil, and then, of course, just an evil. And John Smith being associated with it did him no good. He wrote of Thomas Hunt, Though I have had many discouragements by the ingratitude of some, the malicious slanders of others, the falseness of friends, the treachery of cowards, and the slowness of adventurers, but chiefly by one hunt. John Smith, here's a guy who, uh, supposedly by his own account, has been almost murdered a dozen times. Somehow Thomas Hunt beat them all. Ferdinando Gorgias writes himself that Hunt was a worthless fellow of our nation. And in the future, when it becomes apparent that the natives of what is now Southeast New England were not terribly fond of the English, at least initially and later, Gorgias would write that Thomas Hunt was responsible for the bad blood there. But we know that's not entirely true. Gorgias and his associates had been kidnapping natives, not to enslave them, to use them as interpreters, but nonetheless kidnapping natives since somewhere in the neighborhood of 1604, 1605. So there's plenty of blame to go around. But as we know, the character that you know as Squanto will become quite useful uh, moving forward to the English. But for now, let's leave him in Spain. You don't get to know the rest of this story yet. John Smith goes to Sir Ferdinando Gorgias because Smith has far grander plans in mind after finding this area to be just plain lovely. And I keep calling it this area for a very specific reason. It's not called New England yet. And in fact, what John Smith did in 1614, and perhaps modified in 15 and 16, was make a map of this area. And for the first time ever, he labels it by this name. And the name, and of course you already know it, is New England. John Smith, this man so associated with the success of the Jamestown colony, is also the inventor of New England. Get this, I'm going to blow your mind right now. John Smith also visited the little tiny Wampanoag village of Patuxet. And on his map, in order to ingratiate himself with Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, he renames Patuxet, at least in the English eyes, Plymouth. Yes, that Plymouth. John Smith named Plymouth. When I learned these two facts, my mind, were my mind was just blown. There's a joke that some social studies teachers tell their kids, and it's inaccurate. But basically, they, they mention how the pilgrims left Plymouth, England because of how much they didn't like the conditions there. And then they landed in the New World and immediately founded another Plymouth. Well, that's not true. It was already labeled. It was already uh, ascribed by John Smith himself. So I know I'm being redundant, but just to review, we have New England. We have the name Plymouth. And we have Squanto. And we haven't talked about a single pilgrim yet. And what's in a name? Why is this important? Well, that New England label served to help Gorgias and others in the future, the years coming, to help distinguish this chunk of land from Virginia itself. It used to be called the northern portion of Virginia. Gorgias will very skillfully over the next four years use that different label to establish that the London company is in charge of Virginia. My company, the Plymouth Company, is in charge of New England. And now, thanks to John Smith, one of the native villages is even called Plymouth, just to drive that point home. Gorgeous is very impressed with John Smith, but honestly, Gorgeous seems easily impressed by a lot of people. One of his faults, I would say. But John Smith has big ideas in his head, and so does Gorgeous. John Smith is thinking, 
let's make a colony. Let's try again. Gorgeous as the current head of the Plymouth Company makes John Smith Admiral of New England. Suddenly, Smith, who had been sort of an outcast from Jamestown, despite his own account, found himself back at the top of the Wheel of Fortune. It had been eight years since the failed Popham colony was planted. And there was money there again, suddenly, money to be invested in these new colonial endeavors. Remember, over in Jamestown, John Rolfe, husband of Pocahontas, has started to grow tobacco. And he's had his first or second crop by this point. Suddenly, the new world looks attractive to the deep pockets back in England. But I don't want to get your hopes up. Obviously, you know there is no John Smith colony in New England. It never happened. But he tried. He tried twice in 1615. Had hundreds of people involved. Several hundred colonists in total. Both attempts failed, never even making it to New England. In one of these attempts, John Smith actually avoids pirates. He gets away from pirates. And then his boats spot these large French ships. The French sidled up beside them and claimed that they were only looking for Spanish and Portuguese ships to prey upon. John Smith let down his guard a little, and the French took him and the entire colony at sea prisoner, using his resources and forcing him and his men to actually be contracted privateers working with them. Can you imagine the confusion and Stockholm Syndrome that may have set in being prisoners of the French and also being used to fight alongside them against Spanish ships, perhaps sharing in the victories on the promise that you'll be released after a certain point in time. Very confusing, mixed up matter. And one of the very important like what ifs in history, what if five years before the pilgrims would have reached Plymouth, John Smith planted his colony at his Plymouth or on Martha's Vineyard? Just that twist of fate would have an effect on everything. I probably wouldn't be here. There'd just be some other guy living where I'm living. It wouldn't be me. I probably wouldn't exist at all. Neither would you, especially if you are the product of the United States and its history. We're all in this together. You take out a couple of those cards, it all falls apart. And so it was not to be. And Gorgeous cast aside Smith back at the bottom of that wheel of fortune. The next year in 1616, Smith publishes a book about his adventures in this area he now calls New England. And his map becomes public. To use a modern term, Northern Virginia has been completely rebranded. And John Smith was the marketing agent. Whereas the experiences of the Popham colony flavored Northern Virginia as a cold, inhospitable place to the English people, John Smith's book talked about wonderful New England with its pleasant weather and large, usable harbors and all the bounties of the land that could be utilized to make a living. But the effects of this rebranding would not be felt by Gorgeous or his company or any of the investors for a very long time. And so they didn't really appreciate the work John Smith did. And in fact, John Smith wrote of this entire experience and how suddenly he was cast away. Some of them would not only forget me and their promises, but also obscure me. Now, Smith was a teller of tall tales, but in this case, I might agree with him. I think if you ask any average American or even U.S. history student in grade school to name people associated with New England, John Smith's not even in the conversation. But it's likely he's the inventor, at least of an idea. And ideas can become very powerful things when they control how people act. Trust me, ask the Native Americans of New England. But let's take our heads out of the clouds now, okay? No big colony is on the horizon. What is the state of New England after this Smith colony and its preparations all go asunder? Well, then now we're back to these small summer colonies that by the second half of the 1610s, especially when concerning Monhegan Island, have turned into a all year round business operation, meaning there are people there every day of the year. But of course, this settlement pattern is still not what you're seeing in Jamestown or in future Plymouth. These aren't families. These aren't even people coming to, uh, you know, clear their own land, make themselves a farm and settle in. These are workers who are shifting in and out with the seasons. And we do know for certain that in the same time period, 1616 into 1617, Ferdinando Gorgeous financed an expedition to the area that is now Maine 
under Captain Richard Vines, a man who had worked with Gorgias since at least 1609 or so. Gorgias hired Vines to, among other things, overwinter in modern-day Maine. Find a nice little spot somewhere and just see what the winter is like. Because the accounts from the Popham colony, that covered one winter. That was one point of data. Maybe it was an unseasonably cold winter. Maybe it was unseasonably warm. Ho hopefully not. But Gorgias wanted more data. And so Vines spent a very lovely winter, by his description, uh, near a native village off the Sacco River somewhere. And between Vines and Smith, this notion that New England was inhospitable to uh, the English constitution, bodily constitution that is, started to be reassessed. Now on the native end, Richard Vines reported that the natives he became friendly with, they were all suffering from a disease that the Englishmen didn't seem to be affected by. He will bear witness to something we're going to learn about in our next episode. Stay tuned for that. Vines uh, found his experience there so lovely, he returned to the area often and lived there decades after. And so you could say he was a permanent inhabitant of New England from the English race, if you want to use that term. And he was there before the pilgrims. You can make that argument if you want. I don't care to, although I think I just did. But all in all, these little distinctions don't mean that much to me. Some curious happenings back in England, in this very same time period, 1616, right into 1617, Pocahontas actually arrives in England, Plymouth, England, to be specific. Pretty much being used, in some ways, as the first cigar shop Indian, Pocahontas was a sign that Jamestown was beginning to boom. Meanwhile, not too many blocks away from where Pocahontas was actually staying, Tisquantum was still living with Gorgias. Some historians have theorized or assumed that the two of them must have met. Their respective handlers in the, uh, the, the English realm must have brought those two together. They weren't that far apart from one another in town. But one does have to note that they wouldn't have spoken the same dialects of the Algonquian language spectrum or language continuum. So they wouldn't have been able to understand one another, at least not easily, without a lot of time between them. And in fact, by 1616 into 17, they probably both would have communicated with one another in English. Just imagine what their conversations would have been. Usually I, I just talk rapidly and I make the edits really quick so you don't have time to think, which is my bad. So I'm just going to be quiet for a second. Just think about that. To Squantum and Pocahontas meeting in Plymouth. What would they talk? At that same time, Gorgeous's cousin, Sir Walter Riley, was finally released from prison. Remember, many years before, he had been sentenced uh, to be executed, a trial oversaw by uh, Sir John Popham himself, only for the king to issue a stay of execution. That didn't mean he was out of prison. He, he remained in prison for years with this sentence hanging over his head. At any moment, the king could allow it to move forward and take Sir Walter Riley's life. But in 1616, he's let out. He's let out to explore the Orinoco River way down in South America, for a legendary kingdom, like every, every explorer on a river in South America. He runs afoul with the Spanish, which was something he was not supposed to do. And to satisfy the Spanish diplomats, Sir Walter Riley was beheaded in 1618. One of Riley's biggest fans was the son of the king, Prince Henry, who several years before this point in time said, no king but my father would keep such a bird in a cage. Sir Walter Riley is one of those guys that, uh, when you read about him, you, you see such ambition, such cunning, such, uh, at times luck. And then yet, history has kind of stolen his legacy. He didn't quite live in the right time. Had he lived 300 years before, he would have been a fantastic knight of old. 300 years after, maybe a baron of industry. And although he might be a bit of a household name, He's mostly known, at least in the United States, on this side of the pond, for his failures, such as the colony of Roanoke. And once having claimed a, a large swath of the uh, North American East Coast because of that Roanoke colony, when his monopoly and rights and privileges were taken away, English North America was expanded on the map to cover more of the coast and split up between these two companies, the first colony and the second colony. The first colony being run, and I know I'm being redundant by the London Company, the second by the Plymouth Company. Now here in 1618, 
We know that Gorgias already had fishing operations. By 1618, not just Popham and all these interlopers, but Gorgias was actually starting to make a little bit of income off the fisheries, maybe a little on the fur trade. So much so that he was in a position by 1619 to go to the London Company, or the Virginia Company of London, to protest the Jamestown-based fisheries operating off of Cape Cod. That was within the domain of his company. Things were starting to look up. Then Gorgias sends a certain Captain Dermer, who used to work with Smith, to go visit Martha's Vineyard. At Martha's Vineyard in 1619, he actually meets with Epinau, a man that, of course, he knew from his former association with the Port of Plymouth. Their interaction was cordial enough that Captain Dermer returned in 1620. The details of this encounter, the second encounter, will be in our next episode. But I'll give you a little bit of the fallout from it. Dermer had on board to Squantum, Squanto. And this is how Squanto ends up back in the New World, back in his own village of Patuxet, which of course the maps, the English maps, now call Plymouth. Which now brings us to the unavoidable subject, of course. It's 1620. We have Squanto. We have Plymouth. We have New England has been invented. Who are we missing? Of course, we're missing the pilgrims. And of course, I've been avoiding them, but here we are. The story that's often told is that the pilgrims were supposed to go down to Jamestown and settle somewhere in the London Company's territory. And that by some accident or just lack of patience, they ended up off the coast of modern-day Massachusetts. This story isn't true. Of course you know it isn't true. Because I know that the Separatists, which would be more accurate to the time, they weren't called pilgrims at the time. Separatists or Brownists. They were given several offers as to choices of where to settle in the New World. The Netherlands actually offered them to settle in this area that they called New Netherland. Settling somewhere on what would now be the Hudson River. Guyana was an option for a while. And then, of course, there was the Virginia offer which supposedly they had, had accepted. However, I know, and you can look this up, that the Pilgrims were financed by a man not by the name of Thomas Weston, who greatly preferred New England to anywhere in the South because of the good fishing. And also, Thomas Weston had brought investors to this planned colony of separatists from the Plymouth Company. So it doesn't seem to be a coincidence to me that they ended up within the domain of the Plymouth Company. And just to backtrack a little, the, the Separatists themselves left from the port of Plymouth, where Gorgias was commander of the, of the fort. But here's the nail in the coffin, and it shows you what Weston was doing behind the scenes and Gorgias and this uh, Plymouth Company. After the Pilgrims left, the Plymouth Company would come to be reorganized. That'll be in a future episode. We don't need to get into too many of those details. Other bit of information. This new company, which claimed New England, made a charter for these separatists, allowing them to settle within the domain of New England. The thing is, they made the charter after the separatists had left on a little boat called the Mayflower, and before they ever landed. In other words, the pilgrims were still at sea when they received from this newly formed company out of the ashes of the Plymouth Company permission to settle in New England. Well, how could they settle in New England by accident then? How did Thomas Weston, how did Gorgias, how did all these other investors and this company formed at just about the same time, how did everybody know where these pilgrims were going to settle before they accidentally settled there? Because it wasn't an accident. Don't be a fool. And when they got to their destination, of course, they will eventually meet to Squantum. All of this precursor to the Plymouth settlement is... A bare footnote in history, maybe a couple sentences in a textbook. But the reality is, after Popham, we see a good 13, 14 years of people, whether they know it or not, laying the groundwork for settlement in New England and paving a way for these pilgrims. And among no people is this more true than the Wampanoag, both by things they chose to do before and after the pilgrims showed up and things that happened to them incidentally outside of their control before and after the pilgrim showed up. And that's why our next episode won't be a retelling of the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth. Forget about that. This is the Other States of America History Podcast. We're going to look at things from the Wampanoag point of view. I'm Eric Giannis. Like us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Faceplace, whatever you have. Thank you for listening.